Isaiah chapter 21. Uh, I really, I, Ben, I really enjoy that, man. Thank you. It's a great job. Um, the reason why is because I love it. I love it when all the music drops out. Um, we didn't plan this, but I, I love it when all the music drops out and I can hear all of you singing. And the reason I love it is because specifically today, what I got to hear all of you affirm in singing was how great God was. I mean, it was tremendous to hear you proclaim in singing in voice how great God is, how great he is, and, and that's exactly the very point that, that Isaiah is trying to, 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 to lodge in the hearts of the people of Judah, the very people of God, and, and exactly the kind of thing that through preaching through the book of Isaiah that I hope is lodged in your and in my hearts, that God is great, immeasurably great, far greater than we can imagine, not just great like He's really cool uh, or really good or, or anything like that, but he is, he is so great, like great doesn't contain it. Like, it's hard to put it into words how great He is. And we've seen this all throughout. Every turn, Isaiah is proclaiming to the people of God how great their God is and how useless it is for them to turn from that God to any other thing at all. Anything made or created or any other person, any other ideologies, anything. It is useless and foolish to turn from God to those things because God is greater than all of those things. This is a uniform teaching throughout Scripture. I mean, we're told that Jesus is seated high above every throne and ruler and power and authority. That's everything. And He's seated at the right hand of the Father. He's great. He's infinitely, immeasurably great. And this is what is, what is to anchor the people of God. That's the, the whole point. Isaiah keeps coming back to them and he's saying to them, you're not treating God as great, but He's great, so look at Him. Believe in Him and trust in Him. He's, he's great. He's greater than the problem in front of you. He's greater than the massive imperialistic power who wants to come and overrun you. He is great. Trust in Him and in nothing else. And if there's anything, anything that you get from all of these sermons, I hope it's that. He's worthy of our trust. It is foolish to turn from Him to other things. And yet what we know is that it's easy. It's easy to turn from Him to other things. It's almost sometimes imperceptible. Sometimes we say, yes, I trust in God, but really what we're holding on to is something nearby, something close, something we can manage. So today we're starting a new section of Isaiah. We just finished a round of oracles uh, that God has given to Isaiah for the people of Judah about all the nations around him. He gave him five different oracles, and basically it was just all around the Fertile Crescent, the world at that time. He was showing his control, his power over all the nations. And the consistent thing he was coming back to for the people of Judah was, don't partner with them. Don't trust in them because I am greater than them and the things that I am doing among them is going to prove you silly if you trust in them instead of me. Now, it seems like it would make sense for the people of Judah to get some sort of association. They're a small people. They don't have a big army. Uh, all they have is a big God. Okay, And so that makes them on the, on the site, on side of things, what they see, it makes them very nervous. Because God is, has put them in the midst of a hostile world. And He says, hey, the only thing that's going to work for you is me. But what they see, huge superpower want to take them over. And then they see other people who have solid armies and different kinds of things. And they're coming to them and saying, why don't you join in with us so that we can overtake this superpower. And the message from God through Isaiah to His people over and over again is, it's not a good idea. Because I am sovereign over Egypt and all of their powers about to go away at my hand. And you will look foolish for trusting in them. Or anyone else, name it. All of the people are coming to them. Philistia, Moab, all these people. Let's join together so that we will not be overrun by the Assyrians. And God systematically says, no, 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 no. And so what the effect is, is... Don't trust in other people. Trust in me. 
That's the message for us. We trust in God. Everyone else will fail you. They may not intend to. They may hope that they don't. But they will. So now we move to another section. This is an interesting section. Uh, It's chapter 21 through 23. We're going to take two, maybe three weeks to go through it. Okay, Uh, And uh, and, and what's happening here is God is then giving another round of five oracles. Okay, so it's kind of like the same, kind of the same thing what he did before. Even some of the, the places are the same, but there's one very big difference. The very big difference is in the first round of oracles, you could tell who he's talking about. Okay, so he's saying, hey, don't trust in Egypt. Those guys right down there to the south, because I'm sovereign over them. I'm going to do things in my power, in my judgment. I'm going to do things to them that would make you look stupid for trusting in them. And then I'm going to redeem them. But it's all on me, so you don't trust in them. And you can look at it. You can say in history, this is what happened. This is when Shabraka came. This is when when, uh, uh, the Assyrians were coming against them. And Egypt wanted to, you know, you could see the historical context. And you could go back to it and say, at this time, in this place, it was not wise for God's people to trust in anyone else. But now what Isaiah is doing, he says, is a lot more cryptic. The, the, the oracles are a little more difficult to place. Uh, they may use names here, but the time frames are really hard to nail down. Like all the, all the scholars are scratching their heads. It's like it could be this time or that time. And they've got like a century or two that they're spanning. It could be here or here. You know, we don't know. And the point is, Isaiah is taking these principles and globalizing them. He's not saying specific situation, this is what you do. He's saying in general, now, this is how God's people live. Now, I want you to understand something as we look at this today. We're going to look at uh, the predominant oracle. It's the oracle about Babylon. This is the first one we're going to look at in 21, 1 through 10. But then we're also going to look at Duma and Arabia. Okay, we're going to look at three oracles today. Uh, And we're going to see uh, what... What God is saying. Now, I want you to understand what we are going to look at today is incredibly difficult for Isaiah and for the people of Judah. It's good news in the fact that God is saying, you know, be careful here, don't do this, don't do that. He's instructing his people, but it's a difficult message. It's a difficult message that we need to hear, we need to pay attention to. The first thing that he says to them in chapter 21, verses 1 through 10, is he's talking about uh, uh, Babylon. If you'll remember, when we talked about Babylon the first time, I, I mentioned that Babylon in Scripture, especially in the prophets, typically means all of human uh, scheming, all of human plans, all of the human ways of doing things uh, as opposed to God. So we go to Genesis chapter 11 at the the Tower of Babel. Babel is Babylon, okay? Uh, And this is where all the nations gathered together to build a tower to heaven to show that they could get to God. In their own power, they could get to God, which is a common problem for all us religious folks. We think by doing, we can get to God. And God says, no, you can't. Only I can bring you to me, and that's it. That's the only way. And so Babylon, throughout the Bible, we see it in the beginning, we see it in the end. At the end, in Revelation chapter 18, they talk about Babylon. And Babylon has not come back into power. Babylon is probably not going to be around when Revelation or whatever, when the end comes. But what it's saying is all human effort, all human uh, ideologies set against God are going to fall. You see, there, there's no coming together of those things. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1 tells us that God has shown His immeasurable grace to us so that He could sum up all things in Jesus Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. Everything is coming under the authority of Jesus Christ. And so it's not going to be man's wisdom and God's wisdom coming together. It's God's wisdom is going to rise to the top and be the only thing and all other things will fade away. So here, Isaiah, in talking about Babylon and not really mentioning when or how or what the situations were, He's globalizing for us a principle here. And that principle is exactly what I just said. All human striving against God will fail. Okay? All human striving against God will fail. Now listen to the way that this oracle is received. Verse 20, chapter 21, verse 1. 
The oracle concerning the wilderness of the sea. As whirlwinds in the Negev sweep on, it comes from the wilderness, from a terrible land. A stern vision is told to me. The traitor betrays and the destroyer destroys. Go up, O Elam, lay siege, O Media. All of the sighing she has uh, caused, I bring to an end. Now, in this first part, you, you got to understand, he's, uh, Isaiah's uh, using a play on words. He does this throughout all five of these oracles. He uses a play on words to help you understand something. So, in the very beginning, before he names the fact that it's Babylon, he says, to the wilderness of or in the sea. To the wilderness in the sea. Now, it's interesting that he names it Babylon. Babylon's not really close to the sea. It's, it's inland. Uh, it's sort of in the direction of the sea, I guess. But here's what he's... Here's what he's saying about them, okay? They look powerful and mighty and even majestic and beautiful, but it simply can't sustain life in God's world. Think about it for a minute. The desert of the sea. The desert. Beautiful, massive, and uh, it's, it's stunning, but you will die in it, okay? When, when we did our work over in sub-Saharan Africa, we went uh, to Senegal. Senegal is just below the Sahara Desert. Okay, that's why sub-Saharan Africa, right? Uh, and the whole place is a dust bowl from the Sahara. Sahara's beautiful, massive, uninhabitable land. And all of the dust sweeps through the desert and lands in Senegal. And so every morning you, you see people sweeping like mounds and mounds of dust off of their stuff. But... But life cannot be sustained in this beautiful, massive, powerful desert. He's using figurative language here to help us to see what he's saying about Babylon or all human striving. And he says that this is the desert of the sea, a desert within the sea. So you've got this desert where you're parched and you will, and you will die. And then you have the sea full of water. You're like, yes, I'm thirsty. Here's all of the water. But none of it is drinkable. It will kill you faster. (laughs) And so, even in naming the place, Isaiah is letting us know that this this seemingly strong, powerful, persuasive people is a wasteland. Nothing can inhabit there. Nothing in God's world will be sustained there. And so he says, just flat out, Everyone listen. All of the people of God, listen. We don't put our hope in what man can accomplish. But we put our hope in what God said He would accomplish. Do you see? So in the naming of it, he's telling us already, and he talks about these whirlwinds that come from the Negev and sweep on, and it comes from the wilderness, from a terrible land. The stern vision was told to me. The traitors betray, and the destroyer destroys. Go up, O Elam, lay siege, O Media. All the signs that she has caused, I will bring to an end. All of the weight of what people have done will come to an end. This is a promise, the very same promise that we get in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 where the curses are handed down because of sin and God says, but there will be one who comes who destroys the work of Satan. God says He's going to come and He's going to put an end to all of the the heaving and the weight that all human pride lays on the earth. Look at what Isaiah says in verse 3. This is interesting. Therefore my loins are filled with anguish. Pangs have seized me. Like the pangs of a woman in labor, I am bowed down and I cannot, uh, so that I cannot hear. I am dismayed so that I cannot see. My heart staggers. Horror has appalled me. The twilight I longed for has been turned for me into trembling. You hear what Isaiah is saying? He sees what God is going to do to all rebellious man who tries to thrive in God's world without God, and he is in anguish. Now, maybe we can understand that a little bit. I mean, just think about the things that we just heard last week, okay, that we can do. Murdering babies and selling body parts comes to mind. What an atrocious thing that we do and justify and fund. 
We look at the nations and we say, this is what our striving comes to. What foolishness it is. And Isaiah is looking at what God is going to do against all human striving of that nature. And he says, he doubles over in pain. He's like like a woman in labor. He looks and he sees and he sees the horrible ends to which our striving will take us and the horrible ends that God will accomplish on that kind of rebellion. And he's in anguish. It's hard for us as people endowed by God, given sense, given minds, given all of these things, knowing that we have some power to make things better, yet in all the things that we tend to accomplish, it's mixed with sin and the curse abounds. Isaiah is looking at this and he is broken over the state of man. And the fact that God is coming against man for their rebellion against Him. And we have to say that we deserve it. We've rejected God, the one who gives and sustains life, the one who has all wisdom, the one who makes everything work according to His good purposes. And He looks at us, and when we reject Him, we see nothing but death and destruction. And so God is coming in wrath against mankind. Isaiah sees the coming day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is always received in two ways. By the people of the Lord, with joy. By those who reject the Lord, with terror and fear. Terror and fear, such that they would, we're told in Revelation, that they would run and hide in the caves of the mountains and beg for the boulders to fall on them instead of to stand in the presence of the Lord. Maybe we've underestimated what the return of the Lord will be like. Maybe we've underestimated our depravity. But as Isaiah gets a full vision of it, he is in anguish and broken over the rejection of God by man and what God will do to bring it to an end. It's a serious matter. Now, he shifts here in verse 4, back to verse 5, and he looks at the people of Babylon, what human, human pride and all those things will do. And he says this, They prepare a table, they spread the rugs, they eat, they drink. Arise, O princes, oil the shield. For thus the Lord said to me... Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not, I didn't mean to read that part yet. It says, prepare, prepare the table, they spread the rugs, they eat, they drink. And so you look at it, and they look like everything is fine. They're eating, they're feasting, they're enjoying, they're resting together. And then they rise up and go to war and they expect to win. And then verse 6, For thus the Lord said to me, Go set a watchman. Let him announce what he sees. When he sees riders, horsemen in pairs, riders on donkeys, riders on camels, let him listen diligently, very diligently. Then he who saw cried out, Upon a watchtower I stand, O Lord, continually by day, and at my post I am stationed whole nights. And behold, here come riders, horsemen in pairs. And he answered, Fallen, fallen is Babylon, and all the carved images of her gods he has shattered to the ground. O my threshed and winnowed one, what I have heard from the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I announce to you. Now, he's talking to the people of Judah. Okay? It's a heavy message. It's a message that makes Isaiah double over as if he's in labor pains because he sees the wrath of God on rebellious humankind. And then he says, Look, all of the things that man stands for has been destroyed. All of her idols have been shattered to the ground. Anything that people would hope in and trust in has been destroyed. And then he turns and he speaks to Judah and he talks about a watchman being set on the wall and he sees that wrath coming for them. The riders and the, on the donkeys and the camels, these are, these are the armies coming in. And so the watchman is to look and see. And behold, he sees it. 
And so what he's prophesying to the people, specifically the remnant. If you remember, throughout Isaiah, there is the people of God, and many of them will be uh, swept up in his wrath, but those who trust in him, those who remain in trust, will be spared through the judgment. And so he says to those remnant, O threshed and winnowed one. He's speaking to them specifically. What the Lord... What I have heard from the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I announce to you. And so he's saying, I have seen what God is going to do, and I am telling you. So hold on in faith, and don't look to the schemes and the plans of man. It's interesting that he calls them the threshed and the winnow ones. That's uh, that's a grain term. It's a mill term. That's when uh, they thresh the grain and they uh, and then they crush it. It's a it's a violent act that makes flour. He's saying his people are like that. One of the reasons that is so disturbing for Isaiah is because he's saying that his people are going to experience some of these things, but they are going to be spared through them. And this is important for us. I told you it's a weighty message. This is important for us to know because those who trust God will be spared through the winnowing, through the threshing. But those who turn away and say, God doesn't act like this, will be swept up in His wrath. So here's what I'm telling you. God has said that in this sinful world, His people will experience trouble. His people will be threshed and winnowed. But He will sustain them. In other words, it should not surprise us when trials and difficulties come upon us. We should not expect because we proclaim God that we will face no problems and we will experience no suffering. That is a lie from Satan. It is a false gospel. And so what he says is, as we look, be prepared. Now, he turns here and he gives examples. That's the overarching view. All human striving, all human plans, all human trust in anything other than God will be crushed. Then he looks over at two other nations and he begins to say specifically, this is the kind of thing that I'm talking about. So he first, he looks over in verse 11 at Duma, an oracle concerning Duma. One is calling to me from Seir, watchman, what time of the night? What time of the night? And the watchman says, morning comes and also the night. I w- if you will inquire, inquire, come back again. That's all he says to him. So here's the deal. The, this guy from Seir, that's Edom. Edom is placed strategically between Mesopotamia and, uh, and uh, what's over here? The Fertile Crescent stuff. And, uh, and it's a major trade route. Okay, This is a major trade route, and so how they survive is diplomacy. How they survive is not making anyone angry because they need the trade from both sides. They need trade from this people and this people and any other people who are going to use their trade highway. And so they've said, our plan for survival, the way that we're going to survive, is diplomacy. We're not going to make anyone mad. We're not going to take sides. And so he goes to the watchman. He realizes that the world is in in torment. He goes to the watchman and he says, what time of the night is it? In other words, how long will this oppression last? How long will this curse of God remain on us? How long? And the watchman says, good news. The morning's coming. Bad news. And then the night is coming. Over and over again, That happens. The morning comes, the night comes. The morning comes, the night comes. So the watchman tells the diplomatic nation, there will be seasons of rest, and there will be seasons of anguish. And he says, nothing changed. Inquire if you will. When you're ready, come back. I'll tell you the same thing. In God's world, where people are rebelling against Him, we will experience common grace 
and we will experience times of suffering. So those guys over here, they've settled in on diplomacy. We're just going to be nice to everybody. Everybody's going to love us. And God says, the seasons are going to change. It's going to come. It's going to be good for a while. And then it's not going to work. And it's going to be bad for a while. Over and over and over again. In other words, right now, it might be Assyria who's threatening us, but they will go away. Everything will be good. And then here's going to come Babylon. And they're going to go away. Everything's going to be good. Here's going to come Persia. They're going to go away. Everything's going to be good. Here comes the Greeks. They're, yeah, Over and over again, the imperialistic powers are coming back over and over again. Human pride is going to rise up and try to make themselves God over everyone else. They will be squashed over and over again so that people can see that that's not going to work. And yet in our ignorance, we continue to strive to be God. And so, he says, come back and inquire if you must. But this is the way it's going to be. Humans in rebellion against God. It's going to lead to days where we rejoice because we're out from under the weight of those harsh masters and then another one will come in. It's a happy message, isn't it? You feel good? Welcome to church. Glad you're here. And then on the other side, he turns to the people of Arabia. And he says to them, the oracle, the oracle concerning Arabia. In the thickets of Arabia you will lodge, O caravans of the Dedanites. To the thirsty bring water, meet the fugitive with bread, O inhabitants of the land of Tima. For they have fled from the swords, from the drawn swords, from the bent bows, and from the press of battle. For thus the Lord said to me, within a year, according to the years of a hard worker, all the glory of Keter will come to an end. And all the remainder of the archers of the mighty men of the sons of Keter will be few. For the Lord, the God of Israel, has spoken. So he just turned to a diplomatic people and he says, yes, diplomacy, you're going you're to work that, but here's the thing. Seasons are going to come. Oppression is going to come. Human, human pride, human uh, insistence on being God is going to harm the, the world over and over again. And God in His common grace will take it back. Boom, it will come again. And then He turns to a warlike people. A people who, who thrive in the desert. So other people come to attack them. They're going to have to deal not only with their swords and their bows, but also thirst and hunger in an uninhabitable land. And they've got these mighty warriors, these archers of Keter. World-renowned, apparently, because they're mentioned for archery. These people are a warlike people. You come against us, we're going to shoot you. Done. And he says to them, just give it a year and you'll be overcome. All the things you trust in, wiped out. I know this is a heavy message. What it says to us is, all of our striving, there is nothing you can do. There's nothing you can do to save yourself. There's nothing you can do to protect yourself from suffering. There's nothing you can do. We are under the curse of God. God will carry it out. But He will save His people through it. So if you're sitting here today and you say, if I trust in God, I will never experience hard times. You are delusional. I love you. You're not seeing things clearly. What Isaiah wants us to see here is the God who is over all things, who will stand in opposition against those who stand against Him. And all of the world, all of mankind, is against Him. And none of their plans will succeed. And so it would be foolish for the people of God to trust in them, to emulate them, or to be like them. Because then we would do the exact same thing that brings the wrath of God upon them. No, we're to be distinct. We're to be a people who looks out at all the nations and all the things that, that humans do and strive for and say, maybe that works for a while, but your hope can't rest in that. So if you're hopeful that you can be nice enough to everyone where you never experience any, any sort of hardness or any sort of, uh, of, of destruction or anything like that, it won't work. Or if you say, okay, fine, I'm going I'm to dig in and I'm going to bring out the arrows and I'm going to fight everyone who comes to me and I am going to win the day through my own power. God says, give it a year. Give it a year. 
you will be laid flat. So what are we to do? We're human. We live in this world. We, we, are, we are told sometimes to, to be at war. We are told sometimes to be at rest. We are told to be diplomatic at times and, 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 and in war at other times. We, God's people, God's very people have been told this over and over again. So what is the point? What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to dig a hole and hide? You see, these whole chapters, 21 through 23, is really about cultural engagement. What are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to live in this world that, that is God's, yet it, the whole world is in rebellion against Him as far as people go. All of human pride is, is against Him. And then God is coming against it with cursing and all kinds of stuff. He's, he is coming in His wrath against people. How are we supposed to live when we are threshed and winnowed? What we're going to see at the end of these chapters is we're to live as people who trust in God. Whatever threshing or winnowing comes, we remain in trust. And he says when you remain in trust, that he will come alongside you. He will sustain you. He will carry you. He will be your God. The wisdom literature captures this well, especially in Ecclesiastes. You know, the, the great poem uh, turned into a song, you know, to everything. There is a season, turn, turn, turn. Everybody know? That actually comes from Ecclesiastes. And there are times to do these things and times to do these things. So what do we know? What are we to do? We are not to look at the nations. We are not to look at ourselves and say, in my own pride and in my own power, I can make my luck. I can make my life. I can do whatever I want. No, we are to look to God and say to Him, I trust you. What am I to do? And then He will use us to carry out His plan. What we need to understand as the people of God, as sinful people, is that sometimes it's easy for us to trust in the things that we can manipulate. It's easy for us to have a higher view of ourselves than we really have, to think that we can cause nations to change where God is the one alone who claims that right. So what are we to do? We are to humble ourselves before God. We are to live with whatever comes our way and never waver in trust. You are going to face difficult times. If there is a preacher who has told you different, mark him as a heretic. In this world, you will have trouble. But fear not. I have overcome the world. God is not bound by human pride. He is not wrapped up in it. He is an authoritative figure over it. He will squash it. And that will be the most loving thing He could do for us. Humans in their pride hurt humans. We see it over and over and over again. Just look at the garden when Adam and Eve fell into sin. At first, Adam sees his wife uh, before sin. He sees his wife and he breaks forth into song. At last, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Sin enters in. He sees his wife. The woman you gave me, she did it. She gave me the thing. I'm blaming her. Get her. Immediately, he tries to solve the problem by blaming someone else immediately we begin to turn on one another to save our own hide. Immediately we stop being those, uh, those figures who are meant to extend the glory of God all over the world and we become very self-focused and we harm everything else around us. That's what sin does. All human striving has that at its end. There may have been seasons where we were altruistic for, for a while. Things looked pretty good. But ultimately, it comes down to how am I going to make me and mine survive? And I don't care who it cuts down to make that happen. God is very plain to us here. This world continually will be difficult. So why is He telling His people that? 
He's telling his people that so they will, they will not waver. He's telling his people that because they can trust him through the trials. And when they trust him through the trials, guess what? They return to what they were intended to do. They begin to show his value and his worth above all things. They begin to extend his glory among all the world. There's got to be a place in your life where you stop claiming sovereignty. You're not sovereign over your life. You don't determine if you're going to make it out these doors. You don't determine if you draw the next breath. You don't determine how successful you're going to be, although there are things you can do to make yourself successful or that would lend itself to success. The success doesn't come because of your actions. It comes because God grants it. God wants His people to understand that we live in His world. We don't live in our world. We live in His world, and as we live in His world, we need to acknowledge His sovereignty over all things. We need to acknowledge that if He brings hard things into our life, it's not because He hates us or He's not powerful enough to keep it from us, but because He loves us and He's bringing the best for us. That's a serious kind of trust. We need to, we need to be able to trust that when we look in the Bible and it tells us not to do something that we really, really want to do and maybe even seemingly justified in the world's eyes in doing, that we don't do it even if it hurts, even if it's weird, because... We trust God, and He will save us through it. God will call you to do incredibly difficult things. It will cause you to set aside your pride and and all the things that you think should happen, to set all of that aside, even to go into a deep and dark hole so that He can bring you back out into the light when He's ready. Do you see? But so often we say, God wouldn't call me to go there. He wouldn't call me to do this. I see what he says here, but he doesn't know my situation. No, no. That's not how the people of God operate. That's our pride interjecting our authority over God. The way that God's people operate is to say, whatever you bring, whatever you desire, I submit, I trust. And we live trusting him and not all the wisdom and philosophies and all kinds of things that are around us. Those are the kinds of things that can sneak in and they seem right and they seem good and then they destroy us. What God wants for His people is for us to stand firm with our gaze fixed on Him. If He calls us to be a diplomatic people, be a diplomatic people. If He calls us to be a people of war for a season, be a people of war for a season. If He causes us not to move a muscle in the face of, an, uh, of, a, of, a, of a whole army coming, then we don't move a muscle. I love the example of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know these guys, right? In, in the book of Daniel. These are the guys after Babylon has taken over. They're in Babylon and... Uh, and uh, They are threatened. If you pray, we're going to throw you in a really hot furnace. They pray anyway. Not in defiance. They just do what they've always done. They trust God. And they say, ha-ha, we caught you. We're throwing you in the furnace. They bring them, throw them in the furnace. They're standing in front of King Nebuchadnezzar, and they say, look, I don't know what's going to happen here today. We We might become toast in a few minutes. But I want you to know this. Our God can save us. If He chooses to, He will. That's it. You get it? They said, I don't know what the outcome is going to be here today, but I trust Him. And they're facing a really, really hot furnace. It will kill them. And so Nebuchadnezzar says, okay. Throws them in the furnace. And they don't burn up and they don't die. Because God carried them through the suffering. You see it? That's what we're meant to be. That's not just one heroic thing. And we're like, yes, that's, that's like a hero, man. We're going to look at that. Guy. No, no, that's the way God's people are meant to, to be. God's people are meant to be that way. We trust Him so much that if you throw us in a furnace, if we die, we go to Him. If not, we miraculous thing of God. That's how He calls His people to be in this world. You may never be faced with being thrown in a, thrown in a furnace. But every single day you are called to give in to human pride. Every single day something's trying to slide into your mentality to say that what I am going to do is what's best for me regardless of what God says. Either through ignorance or or willful rebellion. 
Every day we are faced with that. And so every day we must put on our armor and we must fight. We must fight to remain completely under God's authority. Now I know there's some of you sitting in this room that what God's Word would ask you to do in the situation that you're in seems foolish and difficult and you just don't want to do it. Well, can I tell you something? It's foolish and more difficult in the long run not to do it. Would you submit to God's authority? Would you stop trying to take part in Babylon, all of human rebellion against God's authority? Stop trying to insert your own will. Stop trying to be your own sovereign and submit to the sovereign that is. When Isaiah looks and he sees what it requires, he doubles over in pain. When God looks at it and sees, he sees a glorious end to which we will enjoy for eternity. So what we're looking at may say, this is going to be the most costly, most difficult, hard, horrible thing I've ever been called to go through. And what God says is, I'm going to sustain you through it and bring you home to safety. So my plea to you is to anchor in your conception that this is God's world, not yours and not anyone else's. My plea to you is because you live in God's world as God's people, that you would submit to His authority. The mark of God's people is always faithfulness. And then whatever God does to you, trust that He will do more through you as you trust in Him. That's a radical kind of belief in God that says, all I am for you. That's exactly what every person who trusts in God is called to do. We're not playing games. This is not half in, half out. This is all in. Do you trust Him? Or are you still trying to dictate to the sovereign how He should run his world. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. At times it is quite difficult what we see. But Father, your goodness overwhelms us in Scripture. And so if you calls us to go through difficulty, may your goodness be the anchor that we trust in as we go through. Father, may we not waver when difficulties come. May we not trust in everything's going to be okay kind of mentality, but trust that you are working throughout all of history to bring about your wise and good ends, and you require of your people to trust you through all of it. Oh, Father, make us a faithful people. May there be no thing that stands between us and you. May we see what you have said and do it. And then may you be glorified by the way you sustain us. And not only just sustain us like we're miserable in being sustained, but you sustain us in joy. So Father, help us to do the difficult thing. Help us to submit to your authority. Help us to display your authority over all things as your people are meant to do. Father, we love you and we trust you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.